Welcome back to the Beat Break Morning Show and the Beat Break Podcast, Sean Garvey. That's right, I had to play that sweeper one more time to let you all know that you are tuned into the Beat Break Morning Show once again. I am Sean Garvey at Sean Garvey ATL on IG and on Twitter, Facebook at Sean Garvey. We got the homegirl Star Kells on the morning show. Hey, you guys. Good morning. How are you, Star? Good morning. How do you say, wake that ass up? Wake that ass <laughs> up. <laughs> Facts. Facts. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Hey, if you if you didn't if you didn't wake up to the first hour of the program, then wake your ass up again. Shout out to Coop DeVille who joined in with me and some others during the first hour of the Beat Break Morning Show. So you all definitely be on the lookout uh, for his next event coming up. Part two to Laugh, Don't Shoot Comedy Show. It is going down in the ATL. Uh, shout out to DJ Rollum. He couldn't be with us for the remainder of the show. He had an emergency, so we are holding it down for him. But we do have a special guest. On the live line, I am so excited to have this brother on, uh, Star Kells, and he got a story to tell, a very interesting one, and I can't wait to hear it. We got Brother King Solomon in the building. King Solomon, good morning. Peace and blessings. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. How's everybody? Oh, man, we great, man. You know, we great. We turned up. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Y'all turning me up. I feel it. <laughs> Hey, man, it is all good, my brother. It is all good, man. So um, you have a very, very interesting story to share to us and to our listeners. And it's so funny that we have you on the same day and the same show as Coop DeVille, because in the first hour of the program, we were talking about his comedy show that is still ongoing. It's called Lab Don't Shoot Comedy Tour uh, or comedy show, I should say. And it's basically a show where he gets a bunch of comedians, including himself, to put together a show to get people to laugh and not be out there in the streets committing violence and harming each other. Especially in Atlanta, uh, we have an increase of violence that is happening every year, every day, every week, from gang violence to domestic violence to even road rage. All kinds of stuff is happening in Atlanta. It's not just only in Atlanta, too, but it's other. It's in other places across the country. And uh, folks like Coop DeVille and many others are raising awareness uh, about the violence that's, that is happening in areas where people are getting hurt. Uh, but you, I want you to tell your story and uh, share with us what you've been through and how it helped you get to where you are at now. Man, first of all, it's an honor and truly a blessing to be a part of this show. I'm very uh, excited, very enthused. Yes, uh, I started Thank off, I'm, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. You got a question for me? Oh, no, 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 uh, go for it. The floor is yours. You are from Chicago. Shout out to my yeah. people out there in Chicago. I, I got friends in Chicago, yep. From Chicago, Illinois and uh, I go by the nickname of China Man. A, a lot of brothers that are part of the organization out of Chicago, uh, Vice Lords, DDs, Latin Kings, Stones, all the organizations, Latin Disciples, the, the street, the street organizations, probably heard of China Man. A lot of them know me. Been in and out of prison since I was eight years old. I've been through every level of prison, juvenile, county, state, and feds. I just did 24 straight years on a mandatory life sentence in federal prison. Through, uh, through the blessing of God and the changing of the law, I was released because of my uh, good programming, transitional change in prison. I took a, a page out of Nelson Mandela's book, Take Prison and Make a University. Education is the most powerful tool to change the world. So I educated myself in prison. In the streets of Chicago, I came up in an organization called the Vice Lords. And I was a very influential leader in that organization. And that led me through the prison system. And throughout that, I have learned a lot about violence, uh, violence prevention, the reason why violence is apparent now, 
is just the same of what's going on today. In prison, I had reached my lowest point at one time, actually contemplated suicide at one time because I had a mandatory life. Mandatory life in the feds mean you're never getting out. You're going to die in prison. You have two forms of life. You got mandatory life and guideline life. Guideline life means that the judge who sentenced you can reduce your sentence at any time you want to. Mandatory life, the only way you get a reduced sentence is through the change of the law. So Congress had to change the law and the president had to sign a bill for me to get out of prison after 24 years. Wow. Wow. Within that, within that journey, um, I had reached a low level in my life, got into it with a CEO. They put me in a dungeon in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania called G Block. And in that dungeon, I found myself, I found my spirituality, I found God, I found my weakness, I seen my strengths, mainly my weaknesses. I actually, that's where I contemplated suicide. I didn't, I didn't want to uh, live because the dungeon was very, very, very awful. It was like uh, they had rats, roaches running around in the room. It was real dirty, nasty. If anybody been to Lewisburg G Block, they know what I'm talking about. That's the worstest place in the federal prison, even worse than then ADX or Merriam. Those are the maximum. But those maximum prisons, you get your own TV, it's cleaner. Lewisburg G Block is designed to break you mentally, spiritually, physically, all around the board, your body, everything. So there is where I really got a true understanding of who I, who I am. And I lay on that floor contemplating suicide. I just cried out to God. You know, uh, I got to say, there is a God. I truly believe that. For myself, I got to say, it's truly a blessing that I am a spiritual man now. When I cried out to God, it was a subtle change in my life. It wasn't that dramatic. It was subtle. I just had a, a thought to get up and start cleaning my room up and to start exercising a little bit. And I got these revelations from God. And I seen one of my guys, I called out to him on the yard. I called out the window and he heard me. And when he heard me, he went and gathered up all the prisoners that he could in Lewisburg. And they staged these events all around the yard, in the library, in the, the chapel, in the, in, the, in the units, in the library, in the rec center. And the guards would come over there and ask them, what is wrong? What's going on? Why y'all stage these events? And they said, uh, you have a guy back there named Solomon Montego. He's the only one can straighten these issues out that we got going on in the yard. I didn't know what was going on at the time. So they came back and saw me. And they told me that uh, we might let you out on the compound. So I didn't know what was going on. I was like, OK. So when they came back again, they put me in a shoe. The shoe is called Special Housing Unit. It's, it's the hole for the feds. So when they put me in a special housing unit, it was like I was in a five-star hotel. You know? You know, showering yourself, you know, room was clean, even the food tasted differently. So from there, about a month later, they came back to my room and told me that I'll be let out on the compound. So when I went on the compound, I see my partner, and he told me what he did. And that's when I started really the change began. I started reading these self-help positive, uh, self-help books, Think and Grow Rich, Power the Subconscious Mind, The Secret. All them positive self-help books I read, and they helped me transition my my attitude I changed my attitude that's why attitude is very important attitude means how you feel about something how you feel about yourself how you feel about life how you feel about God I feel about your children I feel about work I feel about working out I feel about when you eat when your attitude is positive everything changes so I understood the power of PMA positive mental attitude so I changed my whole attitude I changed the way I thought I changed the way I move I changed the way I act and that's what started helping me transition to the person I am in today, here today. So in that transition, I realized that it's the mental state, it's the mental state that keeps you where you're at. I call it, uh, I name my company HIT, Highly Intelligent Thought. It's bringing one level of thinking to the next. That's why Nelson Mandela said he took prison and made his university. He put it in his mind as his university and if he came back. So when I understood the level of thinking changes, it changes your life and everything else. That's what I took on. I changed my thoughts from street thinking and negative thinking and thug thinking and all these other negative thoughts into positive thinking. 
you know, and that's what changed me. And within that, I started getting revelation on knowledge of how to get out of prison. And the first thing I got uh, knowledge of is to take all these programs way before they changed the law, 15 years before they changed the law, I started a program. I took almost every program in the federal system. And when they finally changed the law, the judge looked at my, uh, my body of work, all the programs I took, and he said I deserve a sentence reduction. And he reduced my mandatory life sentence to 28 and a half years. And within that, I had 24 years in already, we're halfway out, halfway house. Uh, I got right out, I've been out a year now. Wow. So what I'm doing now, I'm taking my company hit, high intelligence thought, and I'm using that to use it for violence prevention for at-risk youth and anybody that needs to know the knowledge of why these youth are acting where they act. From my understanding, that's they code of communication, you know, Everything is about communication, especially with humans. They're communicating through violence. That's how they communicate. The only way they feel they can get heard is through violence. And uh, through social media and all this, this is what is happening. You know, when they realize that it's a big thing, so they want to be heard. And they will speak it is through violence. So I'm just here to plant the seed of through that violence, hey, you might end up with a life sentence through that violence. Hey, you might end up getting your brains knocked out, you know? And uh, I've seen the reaction of these youngsters in prison. When they come to prison, this is what I've seen personally. When they're on the streets, they these big old killers and carry these big old guns, they the man, they, they, they fear. But when they come to prison, they, they back to a baby again, mama's boy. The first person they on the phone with is their mamas who they ain't talked to ever, almost ever in the streets when they are here doing all this madness. So when he gets to prison, now they call their mama crying on the phone. Help me, help me, help me. Don't got a, don't got money to pay for a suit in prison. Mm. He was this big old gangster, came with this big old gun in the street. What they, what that, what they doing that at? How that add up? You tell me. That's when I realized that there was something wrong with the youth out here. Mm. You know, they come to prison and don't know nothing. Can't even fight. Can't even defend themselves. Can't even uh, buy a suit. Can't even don't even know how to uh, go to school. Don't, don't know how to do nothing. So when I saw that, I took it upon myself as a mentor to mentor these youngsters, the ones that would listen, mm. you know, and they would come. I had a life sentence, so that's how I always come and say, hey, you don't want to end up like me. I got a mandatory life sentence. You know, do you want to spend the rest of your life in prison? And a lot of them would look at me. They put me on the phone with their mothers, their grandmothers, their uh, family members. I would talk to them, and I started mentoring them. They didn't have to get in their GEDs. Teach them about personal hygiene, respect, you know, taking cuss words out of their language, you know. And a lot of these youngsters, they, they, they took hold of it. You know, a lot of them home right now doing good. And their mothers today still call writing. So that's what I do. Uh, I think I'm, I came back to deliver a message to help the youngsters, anybody that need help. That, that, that's a part of that, uh, that movement, you know, with, with that violence. Mm. I just wanted to let King Solomon speak and not even jump in and ask one question after another. Because uh, how many times? <laughs> and, and, and we got some. We, we definitely got some. Uh, because I've heard men who have been incarcerated in prison before talk about the things that they have witnessed and experienced while in prison. And they share... The same thing that you are sharing to us. This is not a place that you do not want to be in, regardless of your age, how old you are. This is not the type of place you want to be in. And we can get into, because this is going to be a, a very big, important conversation. We can get into the politics behind the prison system, the, how it, how racism ties in with the prison system especially with black men, uh, the business aspect of it. It's a, there are a lot of layers to peel from this conversation, but I yes, wanna go back further um, before fast forwarding into the conversation and talk about, if you don't mind, talk about your childhood as a kid growing up in Chicago, if you don't mind. Oh, that's an excellent question. My childhood, started off on the north side of Chicago in the green, in, in the Cabrini Green area. That's when I first see the, the real site of organized, uh, 
organized organizations, as they call gangs in the city of Chicago, these organizations, they ran everything back then. We talking about like in the 70s, they ran the game room, they ran the school, they ran the parks, everywhere. So this is this, these were who our role models were, you know. Uh, many brothers in Chicago as part of these organizations don't like to call be called gangs because they are organized, seriously organized, chain of command, everything from top to the bottom. So they like to be called organizations. So that's that's quickly be understood. So now that I seen this, I was a a sports uh, fanatic. I love football. I was a natural football player. Could have went somewhere. I was very, very good at football. But the neighborhood that I was in, the organizations, they ran everything. So I, when I seen that, I really gravitated to that because it excited me. My father had left. I had two brothers, my mother at home with us. And I felt like that I wanted that protection. I wanted that you know, that commodity, I want to be a, a part of some, you know, I should have stayed with the football thing, but I took that route. When I took that route, man, my whole life changed, you know, and it was exciting, but at the same time, man, it was very, very, very dangerous. And from that point on, I experienced juvenile, going through the juvenile system, that was rough. You know, uh, you're fighting, you know, you, you, you're standing on what you believe in and your, your perspective organizations. From that point on, I released. Now I got a reputation in the streets as Chinaman. You know, I wrote my name Chinaman from martial arts. My mother always made sure that I learned how to fight. See, back in my day, we used the hands. You know, wasn't no guns too much. You know, you brought a 22 out. You know, that was big back in my day. You know, wow. yeah, that was big. You know, anybody had a 22, you know, you would consider, you know, uh, you know, like that, you know. So we used, we, we fought. So I used to always, I was small. So I used to always had to fight fight the bully. So my mother put me in martial arts school and I used to always wear my gi, my, my kung fu garb around the neighborhood. That's how I earned the name Chinaman. And uh, I was glad I learned how to fight too because I needed it in, in the jail system. So once I was released from the juvenile system, I went through the county system. Another, uh, the county, Cook County Jail Chicago is the most treacherous jail that I ever experienced in my, even the feds, even the state. You know, that's, they say, if you can make it in Cook County Jail, even I heard about LA County Jail, if you're making those two county jails, you can make it in any jail in the world. That's when you really being tested for who you are. Once I went through the, uh, the county system, I come out more reputation. I'm thinking the streets is the life. I'm in the streets selling drugs, you know, doing, you know, uh, uh, as a criminal, criminal minded. How old were from- you? How old? Two questions. Yeah. How old were you when you first, because I, I remember you saying as a child, it kind of looked kind of glimmer and glamorous to you to see the organizations, right? What age did you realize that that's what you wanted to do? What age were you when you're like, oh, I want to, I want to be a part of this organization? About 13 years old. Yeah. Okay. So you were thought, 13. Yeah. I started going to jail since so I was eight. The first time I experienced jail, I was eight years old. But when I seen the organizational power of, 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 the, of the streets, I was about 13 years old. Okay, so you already had experienced jail at eight. Yeah. And at that point, did you think when you went to jail that first time that it was something big? Because at, at eight years old, Sometimes I feel like people don't understand that we understand at eight what's going on around us. And even though we are kind of green and naive to the world, we still know right from wrong, you know, certain things. So when you first got into, um, that, that was juvenile then, right? Juvenile system. Yes. Did, you, did you understand the impact that it was going to have on your life going forward? Or you were just kind of like, hey, you know, I got in trouble, I went in, I'm getting out. I kind of understood it, but at the same time, it was, it was dramatic, you know, because I went to jail for stealing out of a store. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you're a juvenile like that, they take you home first to your parents. And my mother told them to lock me up. Okay. And that, mother, that, that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a lesson. So, you know, you know, you're going to jail. So, you know, you like, oh man, jail. 
But the ironic part about it, this is the funny part about it. When I went to jail, uh, uh, I stole some playing cards. Like, but when I was in jail, it, they had me in a cell with, a, with some more guys. And the guys, I was little too. I was eight. The guys asked me, say, hey, shorty, you know, what, what you in jail for? I said, I'm for stealing some cards. They thought I meant some driving cars, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I am stole, stole some vehicles, a vehicle. So they, they kind of put me on a pedestal, you know, they put me, you know, hey, that's your bed right there. And, you know, and that's what, to me, was a turning point in my life about jail because, you know, how they glorified me as a youngster doing something big like that. I didn't, some told me, don't even tell them, you know, no, I was playing cards, not a car. Some told me don't even say that because if I said playing cards, they might would have beat me up. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I said cards, they was like, "Oh man, this dude." You know, I was eight. So uh, a couple of hours later, my mom came and got me. She she uh said that was a lesson, but it was uh it was something else. You know, in, in my mind, that mental. You know, I looked at jail as being nothing at eight years old, and I think mm -hmm. that took me down the road right there. And that was what I really wanted to get from you because yeah. if it had scared you, you may have taken another path, but it ignited something in you to it where did. it made you fearless to being in the system because of the reaction that you got in there. Okay, so now let's fast forward. You, you get out, you go back into the streets, you join the, the organization, 13 years old you go back into the prison system and when you come out, you're a big guy. Your name is yeah. on the streets. You're a Chinaman. Yes. Okay. And at this yes. point. Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Chinaman and uh, now I want to get the street reputation. Now I got the jail reputation. Now, Cause see in my day, and this is sad. This is sad about people you know, back in my day, it was considered as a honor to go to jail. Wow. Yeah. You know, a badge of honor to go to jail. I'm going to call you back. Yep. It was a, a badge of honor to go to jail. So I look, you know, by me being in jail already, you know, I didn't care about going to jail for nothing. You know, back that was my mentality. So, you know, that's that's how I carried in the streets. So a lot of people is scared to go to jail, you know, when, when I, I took it all away. So when, when they seen that mentality, you know, people would back up, you know, people like, oh man, you know, this dude don't care. So I've been to jail already, you know, I understand, you know, I can survive in jail. I'm a big dog, I go to jail now, you know. So that that's how that was. And uh that led me to the county jail, and the county jail was very, very, very rough. You know, that's when I really realized, hey, I stopped thinking then, like, man, I don't know about this jail stuff, you know, but I survived that. I be, mean, you know, it's like I adapted to it, you know. And when I got out, I went to the state, the state uh, uh, prison now. I went into the state. The state was much more smoother because now I made it through the county jail. The state way more smoother. And I got out on more season. Then now I, I got caught up in a crack cocaine conspiracy. And I uh, got sentenced to life in prison, mandatory life in prison in the federal, in the feds. And uh, that was it right there. From that point on, man, it was, that journey there was something else. I'm, I'm glad you said that um, because to this very day, right, people still think that jail is the same thing as prison. And I used to think that, I used to have that mentality thinking that jail was the same thing as prison. It's the same place. I hear it all the time. Oh, this person is going to jail for 20 years. This person is going to jail for 40 years and so forth. But elaborate a, a bit more on the difference between jail and prison. Because some people, some people don't know. And, and if you don't know, it's because you've never been a part of that world. You never went to jail and or prison. But yeah. from my from my understanding though. It's a prison difference. is it's a difference. Prison is much more intense. It's much more intense. It's much more e extensive than jail. Well, jail, first of all, on the legal side, first of all, jail, you're not a convicted, you're not, you're not convicted of a crime. You are being charged, first of all, unless you're serving some jail time. 
for something that's a misdemeanor or something. But jail is jail is designed to you serve less time. You're fighting your case, you know. So that's what jail is. You 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 just fighting your case. You're not being convicted of anything. And jail is a little more, I say, a little more pettier or more stricter, more confined in prison. You know, a lot of people go to jail and, and get in those situations by going to court. They be ready to cop out and go to prison because prison is a lot more laid back. You know, you, you got your time, you know, everybody is, you know, uh, more, more situated, you know, the, the, the food is more better, the commissary is better, you wear your own clothes, you know. The main thing about the jail that I, that I experienced is this, like, you're fighting your case and it's rough, you know what I'm saying? You, you're going to court, you don't know what you're going to face, the food, you, you, you're busy behind the glass when your family come. But in prison, you know, everything is much more, the food is different, you, you know, the clothes, you know, the commissary, and you, you, you have physical contact with your family in prison. So that's, that's the difference. So a lot of guys, when they go to jail and they fight in their cases, they be ready to get up out of there. And, and, and we call it going to the joint. You go to the joint so you can, you know, lay on back and, and, and do your bit. Oh, yeah. I haven't heard that term in a while. The joint? <laughs> yeah, so we call it the joint, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, you're going to the joint. Oh, boy. Going to the joint. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, for those who are just tuning in to the Beat Break Morning Show, we have King Solomon uh, on the Beat Break Morning Show talking about life in jail, in prison, and the aftermath from it. A very important conversation to have on the morning show with yours truly, Sean Garvey and Star Kells. And so uh, going back to the earlier years of, of and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I want to make sure that I heard you correctly. You was a part of the Vice Lords in yeah, Chicago. Uh, right. Yeah. A you major part, part of, of it. The, of course, the, the Vice Lords. And, you know, there's other rival gangs in Chicago and in other places as well, too. And the understanding that I got, I've never been in any type of gang uh, association or organizations myself. I do know people who have been involved in those type of organizations. But to me, what I've learned over the years is that young people that go into those type of organizations, they look for the support. They're like their support system that they did not get from their mother or their father. It's not so much of the glamorous or the glitz of the gang organization, but it's just more so of family. Like, you know, these are people that are ride with me, that uh, kill for me and, you know, do all these things that I could not get at home. So was it that, was it like that with you growing up as a child? Yes, it was. As I said before, as a, as a young boy in Chicago, I noticed that these organizations, they ran the streets. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. They ran everything in the streets, everything. And I realized this, and if you wasn't really a part of that, from my understanding, you know, you were susceptible for anything. You know, your crib could get broken, your car could get stolen, your mother could get beat up and raped. This was happening back in the, the day of Chicago. So we called it uh, being plugged. You know, you're being plugged with something. So once I understood this as a young, as a young boy, I felt like I had to do this. You know, I had to uh, become a part of the organization not only for myself, but for my family's safety, you know, in the environment that we were living in. And I was right. Wow. I was right. Yeah. Because uh, when you're not a part of an organization in Chicago, on how it was back in the day, now you're susceptible for, for violence, you're susceptible for all type of stuff that, that can happen to you in, in, in the neighborhoods. But when you're about something, when you say, man, you know, I'm a gangster disciple, I'm a vice lord, I'm a black stone, I'm a Latin king, I'm a same disciple, you know, I'm a Latin disciple. Now you somebody, because now they know if you got a problem, you, you got, you know, two, three hundred people coming with you when, when they come. See what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And they, when they come, they're not playing. So this is how the organizations ran the streets in Chicago. Very organized, very well put together, 
very intelligent, very smart. You know, it's just, you know, when, when it comes to criminality, when you break the law, you go to jail. Other than that, you know, it was a safety zone for a lot of youngsters like myself, especially when you have no father or no male figure to teach you how to be a man or how to, how to move, you know. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's, that's facts. Facts. Start. And, and oh. I'm going to tell you this too. I'm going to tell you this. Okay. The best thing about the organizations in Chicago back in my day was they didn't tolerate no type of BS like rape and all that type of stuff. They, they catch a rapist in the hood. He's already beat up before the police get there. That's how the error I come up with. If, if, if a, a mother or elderly or a child get messed with, before the police get there, the organization didn't handle the business on them. Mm -hmm. No, they didn't tolerate that stuff. So not saying that the organization was the police, but they was the last line of defense in, in the communities because they will call on us before they call the police because the police will come and won't do nothing. Mm. You know, the organization will get to the bottom. If your, per if your mother purse got snatched and it, it got reported to the organizations, you know, that purse would be back in, in your mother's custody before the night was over with. Right. With everything, with every, with everything in it. With every, yeah. not, not one penny missing, huh? Not one penny missing. <laughs> Fact. Now, that's, Fact. that's big, right there. I, yeah. I, go ahead. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say, like that was the thing back then too, with gang organizations, especially out there on the West Coast. At first, those gang organizations were meant to be existed to protect their own people from the police. So it was their way of uh, alleviating police brutality and from the police to come into those neighborhoods and uh, prevent them from attacking their own people. And yeah. then over and then the next few years and then the years went ahead. And now, you know, the dope happened. Of course, you had the crack in the 80s. A lot of dope was moving around in those neighborhoods and it turned into something completely different where yes. now it's more rival gangs going at each other. Uh, if you wear the wrong kind of colors on your shirt, on your shoes, you could get jumped or something fatal could happen to you. And it just spiraled from there. Uh, what do you think, well, you, did you, do you think it was more so of the mindset over the years for these type of gangs to go from protecting, protecting the neighborhood uh, from from bad officers, from bad cops, to now the the situations that we've seen unfold over the past few decades. Not not only bad cops, but predators also. Any type of predator that was in the hood was uh was dealt with as well. So if if uh you was a predator or uh, a racist cop or so forth like that. You know, the organizations protected the, the, uh, the, the community from that. What, what I think what happened was just like in the Black Panther, if you ever seen the movie of uh, Black, Black Judas and, the, and the, uh, Black Messiah, I mean, yeah. Judas, Black Messiah. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Fred mm -hmm. Hampton Jr., that's one of my best friends. I grew up with him. So uh, I understand that whole concept of COINTEL. They use Cointel with the street organizations too. And they they pit gang against gang. And to me, you know, if you watch uh Oliver North, that whole situation, they didn't want to spread the, the whole hoods with them drugs. And that right mm -hmm. there, once 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 them drugs came into effect, like that, real tough like that, you know, we got a, a sense of how to get money at a high level. And once right. you start all that money came in. in once all that money came in, all other stuff went out the window. Right. Yes. You know? Yeah. So uh, that corn tail, that thing was big. What J. Edgar Hoover did to our people, you know, uh, the Black Panthers, they was the to me, they was the strong. They was the the the, uh, the cornerstone of revolution of us as being organized on a street factor. You know, if you know what I'm trying to say. The Black Panthers was like that. So 
the government seen what they was on, you know, and they uh they they planted all type of stuff amongst their organization, and they used those same tactics with the street organizations, you know. But then when they flooded the organization, the streets with them drugs, you know, that changed the whole game. Yeah, yeah. But and initially, I initially the organization, especially the vice lords, the vice lords were designed to protect the communities. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. All, all you gotta do is go read the, the, uh, the literature is online and everything. Read the Vice Lord yeah. literature, everything they'll tell you, you know, uh, how it was created, you know, what it was created for, the laws was written later on for, uh, for, for you to be a better man, a better father, better community member, all that. And it's still like that today amongst a lot of the members, you know, they still hold that dignity uh, with them about their family, self and community. To, to better themselves. And most leaders, most real leaders out here in Chicago are slaves to the people. You know, they, they really want to see a change in everything that's going on out here. I know um, what the effects of <laughs> TV, television, the news and all of that sometimes if you are around the world, because I remember being here very young and looking at the news and hearing about Chicago in a bad light um, and gangs being uh, kind of like a sore thumb in the city, taking over the city, killing and murdering. Everything was centered around those things, drugs happening because of the gangs. So it was kind of like you guys became more from being the protectors of the community to the villains of the community. And even at that time, it prison, going to jail, going to prison was associated with, oh, they must have been in that gang. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was looked upon like, oh, just like you said, hey, I went to jail the first time for just stealing some stuff out of the you know, stealing a deck of cards from the point of view of how, you know, you guys were looked at uh, around the country was more so of anything that happened in Chicago was related to being a part of a gang. And even in activism and the movement when it started to get strong in the late 80s, early 90s, it was more so some of it was focused on how to get these kids out of these gangs because the gangs are destroying the community. So even when I think about you saying you're going back and forth in and out of prison, what was the reason why you went back and forth and in and out of prison because you were a part of these gangs or was it because of choices you made as an individual, because I, I only ask this question because sometimes they say, hey, the gang influences you to make choices that put you in prison. But I want to hear from someone who is definitely at the, uh, was at the front fold of everything. And where did your choices lead you? Was it because of the gang that you went in and out of prison or was it more of an internal thing? This is true. This is this is true right here. You can look into it if you want to. There are many organizational members all across the country that never see the jail cell. I know, I know many many brothers right now that's part of organizations that never ever in their life seen a jail cell. You know, they work jobs, they got families. You know, but they was part of the organization. Oh, did we lose Solomon? Oh. Uh, Solomon is on mute. Uh, Solomon? Yeah, he's on mute. <laughs> I think he accidentally hit the uh, the mute button there. Uh, hey, Solomon, uh, you got to take yourself off mute, brother. Hey. Hey, hey. You, you on mute. Can you hear me? I think, yep, we can hear you now. You, you kept talking. I was like, man, he, he's, he got something powerful he's saying, but we can't hear him. <laughs> that, that's King Solomon, y'all, on the Beat Break Morning Show. Can you hear me now? We, we, can, we can hear you now. Uh-huh. 
Okay, so, so as, we, you was, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The last thing we heard you say was, you know, there's a lot of people that was a part of the organization that never, ever seen the light of prison. Um, so I, I guess you're trying to say those choices of you going to prison wasn't solely based on you being a part of that organization. No, my 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 prison is because of the activities I was in, because uh I knew that if I can go to jail, it wasn't a problem for me because I thrived in jail. Now that I was a seasoned uh, going to jail, going to prison, I was seasoned in that. So I knew how to survive in jail. So going to jail was nothing to me. And that, that was the mindset. That was my mentality back then. You know, with a lot of, a lot of good brothers and, and good sisters too, you know, they, they avoided that. They stayed, they stayed out the way, but they were supportive, you know, uh, of the organizations. You know, they was members, so they never seen a jail cell. You know, I'm, I'm one of the ones that thrived in jail. I loved going to jail. <laughs> now, you going to jail, I know, like, being a part of a gang and stuff, and you going to jail, sometimes you actually get street cred in the jail, and you may, you may have perks. Um, you may uh, get things or get treated differently because of the fact that you're in prison. Your organization right now is to uh, shine a light on young men and I guess women as well who are in these situations where violence is the main focal point to kind of like change their mindset because I know what you mean about the mindset change. I meditate, I read, and um, Think and Grow Rich is one of my favorite books. So I understand the power of Prison being in the mind, the way you thinking is a part of the mind and the choices you make are here. They have nothing to do with the world per se, but how you perceive it yourself within. So when you talk in a light of um, excitement and having credit and doing so good in jail and being able to, to survive, there are youth that are starting out just like you in jail. And they're thinking the same way you think. It. They they probably had the same mentality that you had in the past. How being a part of the prison system, going in and out and getting a life bid, what, what is one of the strategies that you're gonna use to help th these youth get out of that mindset of thinking, oh, I, I'm going, I, I got this. I can go to jail. It's nothing, you know, because you know how they, you know, how you, you know how they thinking. Like it's nothing. I, I can do this and get in and get out. And you know, they got me. I'm good on the streets. I'm good in here. You know that type of mentality. What What is one of your strategies to kind of break that? You know. Well, good question. One of my strategies, like I tell everybody, all I can do is come and plant the seed. Mm. I believe that. What all I've been through from the time I was eight years old to now, I'm a living testimony that jail is not the place to be. Mm. Uh, by the grace of God, I was able to get out of a mandatory life sentence. Without that, I, I would be having this interview with y'all right now. I'd still be rotting in prison, uh, dying in prison because I had mandatory life. What I say to them is this I, I keep it real simple. I'm not trying to stand on your neck or Whatever you're doing, you're gonna make your own decisions. But I tell them this, know what you are facing, know what you are up against that you can end up just like me with a mandatory life sentence. Once you know that, now make your choice from there. Once you understand the full consequence of your actions, make your choice from there. And I call that planting the seed. I use myself as a testimony from the time I was eight years old to now, barely coming back of a mandatory life sentence by the grace of God. Barely coming back off of it. Had I been the same, had, if I had the same mentality, moving how I was moving, the judge would the judge would have denied my motion to have my sentence re reduced because I didn't change. I didn't transition, you know. And I have a question about that because the transition is very important when you're in the prison system. Yes, it is. I have relatives that are still in the prison system. And one of the things for me, the main concern for me is because, see, the dirty truth is 
nobody talks about the fact that these black men not only are going into the prison system because of their environment, but they become addicted to their environment and even sometimes a product of their environment where they're partaking in drugs and you know doing criminal activities because this is all they know. So when you told me that you started doing all of these programs and stuff and the judge saw you and was just like, wow, this, this guy is, he's in there, but he's not getting in trouble. He's working. He's trying to better himself and do uh, things that will help them. Uh, two of my concerns now is, of course, they're not offering those programs like they used to. Um, they're seeing that you can actually excel um, if you change the way that you think and uh, the way that you view the world in prison and come out thriving. So I noticed that some of those programs are being eliminated. Also, I noticed that they're not offering a lot of transitioning uh, opportunities for, for uh, uh, prisoners that are coming back into the real world as civilians of the real world. And they might get right back into that same cycle. They might get back on drugs. They might go back to the streets, no matter the age. Um, they may fall back into the same thing that they left with because they don't have a healthy option for transitioning. And I know that you are a little bit fresh from leaving out. So I guess my question is, knowing what the prison, prison, prison system looks like right now, what are the opportunities or the, the advice that you can give to those that are in there right now that have these long sentencing and are really seriously fighting their way out? I have a guy right now who literally is reading about law and literally he keeps sending letters and doing all of these things. And I think it is courageous and wonderful for him to sit there study and learn the law because if you know the law if you know the law the law can help you even in prison um right. so that's one of the things that i know for sure because of the experience that i have but i've never been to prison and especially not in this day and age so what are some other ways that they can help themselves in these situations where they can get out and be free like you? And um, that's my first question. And my second question, I want you to remember this because I might not. What was your transition? Uh, what was the offer that the judge gave you for transitioning into the civilian world? Okay, uh, to your first question, very good question. I take it back to with myself. I woke up one day and said, I refuse to be miserable. You know, we used to have a crew, a number of lifers used to hang out with each other. And we was unconsciously miserable. Well, I mean, didn't nobody want to be around us, but we had life. You know, even though everybody treated us a certain type of way, but everybody knew, oh, them guys ain't never getting out. And that kind of bothered me a little bit. So one day I woke up and said, you know what? I refuse to be like this. So this is what HIT is all about, highly intelligent thought. When you read those positive self-help books, we possess a power on the inside of us that we can speak things into existence. We can create things into existence. So what I did was I started acting like I was coming home. You know, I started working, I got my body, I started working out, I started going to school, I started reading books, I started challenging myself, I took every pro, okay, what type of program it was, Suicide Watch, any positive program, I took it because in my mind, in my spirit, in my soul, I felt like I was going home. Mm. So, you, so you have to feel, you have to put this into your mentality. You got to put this in your spirit, you know, that you are coming home. Okay, how long it takes? It took me 24 years on a mandatory life since. You have to have this mentality every day that I'm coming home. When you get on the phone, you tell your people, I'm coming home. How you move, I'm coming home. You know, you, you confess to the universe, profess the universe, I'm coming home. Mm. So that mindset, things started to change in the universe. 
things started to look different. You know, programs started to open up. You know, uh, people coming. I remember uh, when I first changed my train of thought, and this is very important. It's some small, but very important. My first thing I changed was the way that I eat, my health. I'm a vegetarian now. So when I changed that, that's my first affirmation. So they would have all these health books on the unit, but, but, but when I didn't have that change mentally, I never saw these books. Never. Mm. They right there in my face. But the wow. perception, I never saw them. All I saw was these hood books, you know, the other type of books, you know, uh, uh, with girls on them, all that type of stuff. But when I changed my mentality to health and conscious thinking, now I saw all these books now. Mm. So it's the perception as well. And I have a story that I tell a short story that I learned actually in Think and Grow Rich. You probably remember this story. It was this old sage that he was a very wise man and he belonged to a walled city. And every morning he would come out and play with the children before he started his ritual of helping people. He'd come out every morning and play with the children. That's how he got his day started. So on a particular day, two individuals was moving from their own perspective towns. So uh, the first individual came up to the sage and he said, oh, sage, uh, how is it here in the wall city? And the sage said, well, how was it when you just left? He said, oh man, they killing, they, they, they doing everything under the sun. I, I just don't feel safe there no more. He said, man, it's the same thing going on here. He said, oh, I don't want to be there. So he left. The next man uh, came saying, you know, asked the sage, say, hey, uh, sage, uh, I'm moving. Uh, I want to know how your wall city is. He said, well, how was it when you just left? He said, oh, man, it's beautiful, man. Life is good. You know, uh, good schools, good programs, good education, good everything. He said, well, the same thing going on here. And he opened up the wall gate and the man went in. The moral story is, is that whatever you're looking for, that's what you're going to get. Mm. Same thing in prison. So in prison, when I changed my whole mentality to take prison and make it my university, that's what it became. You know, all the riffraff went away from me. All I saw was me going to school, me learning something, me better than myself. So whatever you're looking for in life, that's what you're going to get. Whatever you put out in the universe, you're going to get that back, no matter where you're at. Mm. And it, it got to the point where I became such a positive force in prison, I started stopping the violence. The wards and the captains would come and get me before they locked the jail down, the, the, the prison down, they'll come and get Montego, come and get me. And I go to the units and I would talk to the guys that's gonna create the violence. And God helped me a lot of times to alleviate the problem, you know. And it, it was that's how I knew that God blessed me with a gift. Wow. Peace and blessings. That, yeah. I, that is powerful. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I don't wanna say I wanna say something, but I wanted you to answer. Oh, the star, second, question. second question. Yeah. And what was that again, Star? Uh, I do remember. I thought I wasn't going to remember, but I remember. I, I had your back, by the way, too. I do remember, but go ahead. You remember? Okay. What was the option that the judge gave you oh, to yeah. transition? Um, yo, I think your question, like, what what, what, what did he take my, uh, why did he take my life sentence off? Or is, is that no. what you mean? No, okay, so what I mean is, you know, like, so once the judge said, okay, I'm going to reduce your sentence because you're doing such a great job, right. right? So then what next? Because, you know, sometimes these guys leave prison and they go stay in their mom's or a, a relative oh, house the, and they go okay, back okay. to the streets. So what right, was right. the option that was given to you to where you had the opportunity to get right before you fully went back into this world like and and you know what it was a good transition uh i received nine months halfway house see yeah and the halfway house that i went to i went to one in wisconsin and chicago and both of them was great help in my transition back to society that was a great help right at the halfway houses so that see and the reason why i asked that question is because um, when guys, especially guys that are very influential in the community, like you were when you were out there, they're looking for you to go right on back out. 
and get right on back into that same thing. And um, because they see you as somebody, as a threat, as a, someone influential. So we call them influential now, like, you know, where you can influence the way people think, move, blah, blah, blah. So of course, they're looking for you to be like, oh, well, he had so much going on then, he's probably going to jump right back in there and do those things. But when your mindset changes like this, you need a support system where it won't cause you to deflect back to your past. And so the halfway house, for me, I feel like people who are coming out of prison like you, this should be automatic offer to them. It should not be an option or, or something you have to beg for. This should be automatically offered to you guys so you can do that transition well and be a part of a healthy uh, society because you're coming in not knowing that the world has changed for you. Yes. So yeah, that pretty much answered my question because I that's one of my main concerns. Um, just that transition for you guys coming back into civilian life. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, we are coming up on the next hour of the Beat Break Morning Show. We are talking to King Solomon about his story, about his struggles uh, growing up in Chicago, uh, became a prisoner, uh, became an inmate in solitary confinement and now a, a free man and going around spreading knowledge and wisdom to young cats, young people that are currently active in the prison system are already inmates in the prison system. And I wanna put a bookmark in this conversation real quick to shout out uh, one of our sponsors here and for those that are looking to get some home improvement, uh, it is springtime now, so there's no excuse for this, but if you own a home or if you happen to rent an apartment, you might wanna contact Silverback Contractors LLC if you need some home improvement. They specialize in painting, pressure washing, bathroom remodeling, drywall, and so much more. They can even help you move your furniture, appliances, and all of your household needs, especially if you are planning to move from your old apartment or perhaps maybe into a new home. So make sure you contact Silverback Contractors LLC at 404-960-1972 if you are in the Atlanta area. They are mobile as well. So if you happen to be outside of the state of Georgia, you can still give them a call at 404-960-1972 or send them an email to Silverback Contractors LLC at gmail.com. And if you are loving the content here, we will have a uh, Patreon source real soon. We will be on Patreon real soon. But in the meantime, send us a donation to our Cash App account. If you are loving the Beat Break Morning Show content, that is Cash App, dollar sign, reach, the number one communications all lowercase and support the movement. We still have King Solomon right here on the Beat Break Morning Show. A term that I want to bring up is institutionalized. We hear that plenty of times from people who uh, have came out of the prison system or have are already still serving their time in prison. It's one of those things where if you've never been in prison before and you walk in there, you know, innocent, you may have not even committed a crime. You may have been judgely wrong or accused for uh, committing a crime that you did not commit. And six months, the first six months in, you start to get acclimated. You're in that process of getting acclimated to prison life, but you want to get out of there. You want an appeal. You want to get back to civilian life. You don't want to be in there, right? And then over time, you're still waiting for an appeal. You're still waiting to get free. And then a year go by or two, and already you're, you become institutionalized. You, you don't want to leave prison. You don't want to leave jail. You don't want to leave prison. Uh, you don't care about getting a pill. You don't care about whether you get free or not. This, this has become your home now. Mm -hmm. um, so to you, King Solomon, has there ever been, because you said that um, 
it just a few moments ago something very powerful and it was that mindset you keep telling yourself i'm coming home i'm coming home i'm coming home but have there ever been times where you had conversations with your fellow former inmates in prison where they didn't have the same kind of mindset as you they just like you know what i'm gonna be here until the day that i die whether they committed a crime or not uh have you ever had a conversation with them and what was that conversation like with those inmates or, or those people in prison that didn't have the same kind of mindset as yours? Well, before I got the mindset that I got spiritually and got the revelation to affirm my release, I was I was one of those people like that. You know, I, I uh, at one time, you know, I did feel that uh, I would spend the rest of my life in prison. So I understand the mentality when many, many, many motions you put in and get these get shot down, you know, relationships get tore up, you know, because of prison, your kids grow up, you know, without you, you know, it's just the whole thing, you know, your, your family members are dying, you know, and you're experiencing all this in prison with a life sentence. So now all this stuff is weighing on you. So now you, you, especially when you, you petition the court, you, you know, I have I have issues that I knew that I I, I, I could have won on that you feel like it's in, inside of you. Then you get that letter in the mail saying, you know, your motion has been denied. You know, so now you still feel like, man, you know, I'm not never coming home. And the conversations be institutionalized and be okay. Now you're claiming, now this is what I tell people very important. You you you, you gotta be careful. Of this you start claiming your cell as your home. Mm. You start claiming the phone, the prison phone, as your phone. Mm. You know, you start claiming the washing machine and dryer as your washing machine and dryer. That's becoming institutionalized. You start claiming a, a certain seat in the library as your seat, you know, or in the movie room as your TV. You know, that's when you start becoming institutionalized. You start in the going to weight room, you start claiming a certain bench or a certain set of weights as your weights or your weight, your weight bench. That's when you start becoming institutionalized. And when you do that, man, it, it, it's a hard fight from there. So be careful what you claim. See, when, when you start claiming something, you become that. So that's why I realized, understand the, the true affirmation of claiming my freedom, taking my life back, you know, not claiming the institutional stuff. That's their stuff. I'm claiming my freedom. I don't care how long it take, it's going to take me to get out of here. I'm not claiming that stuff no more. Wow. I love that. Like, it, it's all about mindset. And I know you said something about, um, you know, you started working out and, you know, changing the way you eat. So I'm thinking maybe you should, you know, give the lady something to look forward to show us what you're working with. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I like that stuff. Yeah, just a little bit of comic relief right there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, you know, we got to throw a little comedy. You need to come on the show um, again when we're having yes. fun because we... We get it. I, gotta, I can show a little muscle now. You hear me? Hey, show, okay, show him a little. Let me tell you. Let, yeah. let me tell you something. I, let me tell you something. I've seen some transformations with guys. They go in prison, skinny, slim, and what have you, and then they come out looking all dieseled up. But yeah, I'm like, bro, like, what are they serving you in prison up in there? You know. <laughs> but I mean, that's part of time, though. The the recreation the mindset, the gym. Yeah. The mindset, yeah, it, it definitely will put you in, in shape, you know. You yeah. find yourself doing things in, in the inside that you probably did not do when you was on the outside, like reading books a lot, uh, especially an important thing to strengthen your mindset. And, and that's a survival skill in there because in, in actuality, they don't want you to be educated in prison. Mm -mm. They don't. Nope. They don't want you. And there's this whole thing, there's this whole notion that the prisons, the institutions and the solitary, whatever you want to call them, they serve as a way to re rehabilitate people. Whether you are coming back in or if you're a first time felon and you coming in for the first time, 
it's supposed to be set up for you to re rehabilitate yourself before they send you back to civilian life. But King said it on here that it starts with the mindset. And, and from what I got from it, it seems like the prison is not meant to rehabilitate you if you're going in for the first time. You have to rehabilitate yourself. You have to depend on yourself to rehabilitate. Yeah. Because when you leave, when you leave from the prison system, man, it's the same rigmarole. And we've seen this so many times, Star. Like folks that get out of prison and they looking for a fresh start. They the first thing is they they want a job. Yes. They want a job. They want a job to keep themselves from doing the things that they were doing in the past. You know what I'm saying? I mean, of course, they want to see family, they want to see friends and eat all that great, great food that they did not get while they were in prison. Uh, but they want a job. They do. And, and that scarlet letter follows you everywhere you go when you are trying to apply for a job. And even on the application, it tells you that have you ever been convicted of a felon? And some have to lie in order to get a job, but then it catches up to them. They either lose their job or when they become honest during the interview, there's no guarantee they're going to call you back. You know, you're losing money. You may not have a place to stay or what have you. And you find yourself going back to doing the things that you was doing that put you in jail or put you in prison. So my question to Solomon, Solomon King Solomon, like, have there been times where you thought about going back into the past and doing those things that you were doing to uh, keep you staying uh, over afloat, to keep you in survival mode. Because it's, it's hard out here, especially for a man that just came out of prison for 15, 20 years or whatever. And you know, you're just trying to, you, you're just trying to be a productive citizen out here. Since I've been home, you saying? Yeah. No, I man, I told you it's the mindset. I mean, I told you the story about Mm -hmm. the, uh, the sage and, and, and the movers who's moving. That's very important because now that my mindset is different, there are many, many, many programs that that's unbeknown to us. If you dig for them, there is help out here, man. It is help out here for uh, convicted felons. They got programs designed just for us to get your jobs, get programs, get CDL license, uh, get your license, get housing, all this. It's right in our eyes, man. But because we don't have the mindset, we don't see it. You know, you get what you're looking for. Mm. You know, if you call your state representative, if you call your the mayors, I'm saying they will point you in the right direction to get the proper help you need if you really want it. Period. I've experienced this right now. I get help everywhere now because because I'm a convicted felon. You know, all type of programs I didn't took in. You know, now I'm offered jobs and all mentoring jobs and working in shelters and working in, uh, in, in all type of uh, uh, organizations of uh, violence prevention. All these things are opened up now because my mindset has changed. Right. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's the mindset. I think, too, though, to your point, King Solomon, is we have to be able to share that information. Like social media yes. is the number one powerful tool that we use on a daily, you know what I'm saying? And, and I feel like that should be the vehicle for a lot of us to share information. I mean, even ex-felons, ex-offenders, they go on social media a lot. Like everybody have access to a phone in this country or in wherever you are at. Like, I think we need to do as a, a better job of sharing information, especially to people coming home from prison and say, hey, for all of my people who either serve time here or what have you, here's the number to call. Here's the website to go to if you need uh, job assistance, if you need to go back to school to get licensed and et cetera, et cetera. Like here's the information. So I think we need to use uh, more uh, uh, of that on social media. Did we lose King Solomon, by the way? I, it says, yeah, it looks like he we lost him, but I think it was on okay. accident. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he was okay. trying to do something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we saw him earlier uh, before we came on. We saw him. Okay, he's coming back on. All right. Uh, 
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we weren't on Instagram this morning then. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we, we're working on getting King Solomon back on the Be Bright Morning Show, having a very important conversation on life during and after prison. Uh, something we don't usually talk about on the morning show, but it's something we definitely um, have to talk about. King Solomon, you there? Go ahead oh. and unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You're and back. He's back. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, King Solomon is back. <laughs> Play the sound effects for you for coming back on. <laughs> um, so I'm not I'm not sure what all you've heard, but I was just pretty much saying that we need to be able to use social media more yeah, as a vehicle to share information, especially for people coming home from prison. So King Solomon, um, what, 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 what Sean said, just to add on to that, uh, will you be opening up a platform for your organization? Is your organization for for-profit or is it nonprofit and nonprofit organization? Oh, uh, we have both. Uh, we work with nonprofit and for-profit. Okay, good. So will you be taking advantage of using social media as a tool uh, to help reach the youth because the, the, the people that you're looking to reach now, they're all social media babies. These kids live, breathe. Um, some of them even become thugs and gangsters from social media. Yeah. And that's just the truth. Uh, and so one of the most strongest tools and ways to reach them is through social media. And I know that's something that you have to kind of, I don't know how much you have to get acclimated with it because I don't know what technology they provide you guys with there. I know in the prison system, you can you can get access to some things. Um, so people, you know, have had privileges of, you know, being able to utilize and um, kind of stay in the loop with things. So is that something that you're planning on doing or are you already doing that implementing social media with your programs to reach out yes uh i've already started uh, my social media platform uh, my brother is my pr and he told me so i'm on uh facebook twitter and instagram and we're working on getting on youtube as well you go boy I love that. I'm a yeah, mess. I'm gonna... Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> but I am very excited. I'm very excited about it. I, mm -hmm. um, I really honestly want to volunteer. Um, I do, I am a life coach and I do mindset life coaching too. So, and I, like I said before, I have relatives and people in prison that literally reach out to me for help all of the time and I don't talk about it like that but I was so excited about the opportunity of having you on there because I literally can ask the questions that I want to ask and also I feel it's brave to come on and share your story because there are people just like you that need to hear this across the world and they wow. all need to know that they have to change and reconstruct their mind mentally. And uh, I definitely would volunteer and um, give hours to people who need that help with the mindset change and stuff like that. So you definitely have my support. And I'm so serious about that because we need our black men at home, uh, raising their kids, uh, helping grow the community on the outside uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah i just wanted to put that out there i'm proud of what you're doing uh proud of where you're going and i know it's going to be big because i know you ready you know sean was like hey you thought about getting out and do you know and you was like nah i told you now like i said i ain't going back so that's when you know it's like i'm ready like there's no turning back there's nothing but me going forward and creating the life that I really want for myself and the life that I want for my community. 
And so I'm all for it. Yeah, indeed. Sounds, sounds good. Indeed, that's that's what the chat box is for. For those that don't know, we're on Zoom. So Star would be more than happy to exchange whatever information you need to get in contact with her and make some things happen. But speaking of Star, I do want to go back and ask this question because Star brought up a very good point of how uh, Chicago is portrayed. I mean, even when somebody says Chicago, especially from us, from people of color like ourselves, it has a negative stigma to it. Because when people think of Chicago, they think of the recent events that has happened over the past few years and uh, even with the current state of where parts of Chicago is at. And in media, television and film, Chicago has always been highlighted um, from more so of a drama aspect. I mean, you know, besides the fact that Queen Latifah did a project called Chicago, <laughs> but years after that, you know, Spike Lee did the film Chirac, which caused a lot of controversy. I'm not sure how you felt about that. And then, of course, later on uh, is the Showtime drama series, The Shot. Uh, from your perspective, what are your thoughts on how Chicago is being portrayed on a television and or film level? Well, you know, that's not nothing new. That's, you know, I go way back to Al Capone days. You know, he, he to me, that he brought violence to Chicago back in the 1920s on the level that is, it, it is on. Al Capone was a serious gangster, came from New York, and something happened in New York where he had to migrate to Chicago and became a, a big time gangster and, and how they, portrayed violence, you know, the St. Valentine's Day massacre and how they used to dress and all this, this, this put on the image of Chicago as being a gangster town way back then. So it, it took on that persona, it, it snowballed into the street organizations, you know, this, this who they looked at, you know, as being a, to the level of getting an understanding across, you know, Chicago is a hard city you know, it's, it's, it's gritty, you know. But one thing about Chicago that I know for a fact is it's also a good city. It's also a loyal city. It's also a city, a city of unity. And this is what the street organizations represented, period. You know, it's just that when time comes to, you know, get ugly with it, Chicago is known for that. And they go all the way with it, you know. So these youngsters today, like I say, they, they communicate through violence now because they feel the violence is the way to get their point across. And uh, it's sad how the city is portrayed like that because you got a lot of good people in Chicago that want to do good things and help people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing that makes me think about Chicago from a positive standpoint is the music. You can't deny the music out of Chicago. The artists yes. from Chicago, Kanye, Common. Common is up there. Common is one of my favorite artists, man. Uh, Love him. The Brat, yeah, The Brat, uh, so many others. You know, I, I still bounce to uh, Kusha Conflict from back in the day. <laughs> I still bump <laughs> that music to this very day, but I, I love the music there. I actually still am planning on going up there to Chicago, because like I said, I have some homies of mine um, that are out there in Chicago. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, now, fast forward even more with where we are at today uh, with violence, like even now, violence have escalated to the point where you see it being glorified on social media. And I was saying a few minutes ago that we need to be more involved in exchanging and sharing information on social media to help people coming out of prison get jobs and, and what have you. And so do you think being that you come from the gang organization world, do you think social media, kind of like what Star said just a few moments ago as well, do you think social media 
being the platform that it is, that it could potentially multiply even more gangs, organization and more gang members to do what they do? Do you think social media could continue to breed more gangs? Um, I think it depends on what you're looking for. Like, you know, I, I just got on social media. I've been out a whole year and I, I told myself when I came home, everybody wanted me to get on social media, but I knew I wasn't ready. When I come on social media, I want to come with something. So I came with my whole hit idea. And that's what I'm about. Um, yes, I'm a ex game member and organizational member and so forth, but it's the, it's what you're looking for. That's what I see. If you're looking to be a part of, the, of, of something that can cause a, 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 a snowball effect to be in gains on social media, that's what's going to happen. But at the same token, social media can be used as a token to detour violence, to help individuals that really wants to help. So it all goes back to me is what you're really looking for. Mm -hmm. you know. So I use social media as a platform for me to, to send my message across, to plant the seed in these youngsters and say, hey, you know, what you're doing, man, you need to think twice. And because, you know, the consequences are real heavy if, if you know what you're up against. Indeed, indeed. Um, I know that folks like Snoop Dogg, right? Um, he's still no, repping Snoop Crip. Dogg. Yeah, I mean, we love him. We love him, man. And we love, and we are just so very impressed in his own personal transition and being a positive male role model, you know, just going out and being a football coach and doing movies and, do, and doing TV. We've seen Snoop Dogg evolved over the years yeah. he's still repping crip of course and so that goes back to the notions like when you hear somebody say well you know even though i'm i'm a changed person i am a reformed person i don't do any of that stuff that i was doing when i was with the game back in the day i still represent them is that notion still true like once you are a gang member you always a gang member even though you may not be active but it does it come with you as you evolve or is it more so of you know how you think of the mindset yes uh from my understanding like snoop and, and a lot of us good brothers you know it's looked upon as a family man not as a gang or something that's evil or bad you know uh from my point of view and snoop probably can verify this it's probably been issues where in his life that the so-called Crips or whatever probably saved his life, <clears throat> you know? So, you know, he would not turn his back on his people because, you know, that's where he came from. He, he what you call a success story as part of the Crips. And that's what it's all about because you are a Crip, a Vice Lord, a Stone, Latin King, GD, so forth. That don't make you a bad person. It'll make you a criminal, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's in his heart. It's in people's hearts that, who you are, you know, and so what he's doing, he's giving back to the communities, being a football coach or a life coach and use this experience to help people. I'm doing the same thing. I will not turn my back on my people. Facts, facts, man. Wow. Because, be, because that's who they look to, man. They look to the Snoop dogs and so forth. They say, hey, yeah. man, if Snoop can do it. I can do it too. Right. Right. And, and that's why I've been feeling, even especially quite some time with the youth, they will listen. And, and this is just me. They will listen to the celebrities. They will listen to the rappers first before they even listen to their own parents or even listen to their teachers. I come from a community where television was our role model. Mm -hmm. our, our heroes were the celebrities, were the rappers that we've seen on television or the actors we've seen on television. Like, man, I want to be like that person that I've seen on TV one day. I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like my teacher. I don't want to be like my pastor, but I, I don't even want to be like the local politician. I want to be like that person that I see on television. I want to be like Mike. It's like that saying, I want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan. I want to be like that athlete on TV, you know? And, and so many of us, we grow up especially coming from that community, from that world. We grow up seeing 
the people uh, with the lavish lifestyles or, you know, that sense of family that so many of us didn't get at home. I know for me growing up in a single parent household, it was hard to look up to my mother because it was hard as a young black male to see yourself in your mom. You know what I mean? And like, I, I've hung around different types of people, but some of the people that I surrounded myself with were somewhat bad influences and, and that, you know, we, we were going to end up going into a different path later on uh, once we got older. And so um, I say all that to say with the young generation today, they're going to hear a King Solomon especially after this interview. Uh, they're going to hear King Solomon because there's so many young brothers and even young sisters out there that can relate to what King Solomon is, is saying. You know, if, if you haven't went through what King Solomon went through or what that young Black boy or when that young Black girl went through, you can't tell me anything. You can't talk to me about life and, you know, staying in school and, and stuff like that. You, you don't know what I've been through. And I hear that a lot from a lot of young people. And, and so that's why I feel like people like King Solomon is here for a reason because there's so many young black boys and, and young black girls out there that feel like they don't have anybody to go to talk to other than the rappers, other than the celebrities or you know people who have been in that system and been where they are. But I do see we have Chief Kamara on the live line. Uh, he just joined in with us. I sent him a message telling him, hey, you're more than welcome to join in the conversation because uh, Chief, me and him, we go way back to 89.3 WRFG days back in 2004, 2005. And he brought this brother to my attention. Uh, I see that Chief Kamar is on mute. So if you can hear us, Chief Kamar, you, uh, you can take yourself off of mute there, sir. So uh, we can hear you. Or if you just want to hear the rest of the interview, it's definitely up to you. We still got King Solomon. Chief Kamar, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, my brother. I just want to hear my brother, uh, King Solomon. This is an interview, so I wanted to hear it. Just wanted to hear him and uh, hear his wisdom. So, I was oh, going, man. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, great interview. It was a great interview. Say, say what's up, uh, King Solomon. What's up, my brother? How you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm peaceful. I'm peaceful. How you feeling, brother? I'm peaceful. Yes, sir. I feel yeah, magnificent. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 he's on his way to be a great motivational speaker. I, I'm telling you, gonna be great, man. So he's he's on, he's fired up. I've seen him come a long way. I met him when he was a young man, back in the early '90s, you know. And uh, he's uh, has turned his life around and trying to be inspiration to others as well. So I just I'm really proud of him and just you know uh, I just see him going far in, in this motivational speaking. And he can do a lot for young people because he's experienced it all. He's been through the ju juvenile system the state system and the federal system. So you know, he got a story to tell. So I'm just listening to my brother and I'm just I'm proud of him. That's all. Um, and we love you, brother. Indeed. Thank you. I Indeed. love you too. I think and Sean, and Sean, I, yeah. and Sean I'm proud of you too. I, I didn't see you come a long way, young man. Yeah. <laughs> he, he just, he, he's a great interviewer. You know, he's a great media person, man. He's, he's one, of the, you know, one of the best in the business, you know? I, I do all right. I do all right. <laughs> I do okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we reconnected. We actually reconnected True Story on a radio show, on one of the radio shows on WAOK uh, a couple of months ago, and we stayed in contact uh, from there. But yeah, I've known him from uh, the WRG 89.3 FM days where he called into the show that I was doing back in the day. And I, I forgot how we connected. I think you either came into the studio one night, Chief, and we exchanged information. And then from that point on, we went on the drive to help the underprivileged and, and the people that were homeless or less fortunate right. out there in the streets, give out clothes, give out foods and stuff. That was a great experience to me. And it also humbled me at the same time. Wow. Yeah, that, that 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 was when Catherine Johnson got shot, uh, and yeah, and they killed that they killed a ninety year old grandmother, and we start you know we start rallying. San Croix African Society start rallying uh, behind uh, the calls, man. 
know, police brutality, how they you know, brutalize. And anytime you brutalize all one, we stepped in and, and fought. That's how we met. And we, you know, doing a lot for the community, man. So, you know, it's been, it's been, we've been knowing each other now, I guess, since 2000. That was 2006, I think, or seven. So now that's a, that's a long time, brother. You're still doing it. And, uh, you'll get information to the people, man. So it's, it's Thank great you. knowing you. Good to be back Thank reconnected you. with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Indeed. Indeed, brother. Indeed. Well, we, we're about to let King Solomon go in just a few moments. But uh, Chief, did you have any questions? I think me and Star, we've asked a, a whole lot of questions <laughs> to King Solomon uh, throughout the, the remainder of this portion of the show. But uh, did you have any questions for the King? Oh, no. I mean, we talk on a regular basis, man. I just um, look forward to him getting this message out I mean, because he gave me such a tremendous help to young people yeah, and definitely. to get our, you know, as you see the symbol I have there, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's the, uh, all my life, my organization incorporated. As you see the symbol of Africa and you see the pyramid and the lion, it, you know, the original intent for our organization was to be positive, to be progressive, to heal our community. But COINTELPRO, uh, came in, uh, you have to understand when they locked the Arnold Bobby Gore up in 1970 for a crime he did not commit. And why, why did they fear Bobby Gore? Because he galvanized all the street organizations together, the uh, Blackstone Rangers at that time, and the, the uh, Disciples, and the Vice Lords came together with something called LSD. And they went to the construction sites and they said, if you can't hire the people in the community, we're going to shut it down. That fear, that was that was that was fear. So white supremacy fears uh, black men who can galvanize the community and get them out of this condition. This is why they assassinated Chairman Fred uh, Hampton. Uh, they got rid of Martin Luther King. Uh, they got rid of Malcolm. So this is what they feared. So the original intention of our organizations and brothers who've been through the system—they're not bad people, man. You know. They, they're that way because they were made in America. So that's all I really had to say. But like again, I'm proud of my brother, and I don't want to, you know, uh, interrupt his his uh, him doing his thing. So I get to talk all the time, but this is his time to shine. And I, you know, I think he can tell you uh, better than I can. He's been been through the system, yeah. know what it's all about. You know. Indeed, great words from the chief himself, Chief Kamal. And before we let you go, King Solomon, I definitely want to invite you because me. And the chief, we were talking about it offline, but I definitely want to invite you on my WLK show called The Mental Space. And it's a show about talking and discussing mental health in our community. It comes on Monday nights from 7 to 9 p.m. This is an exclusive, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm personally inviting this brother, King Solomon, <laughs> on wow. to my Monday night show on WLK 1380 a.m in Atlanta, man. So are you able to accept the invitation, sir? It's an honor and a blessing. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's a yes to me. <laughs> indeed, yeah. indeed. All hey, right, brother, uh, hey, hey, brother Rashawn, and, and we're going to be in uh, Atlanta on May 28th for two events, the Black Economic Empowerment Conference and uh, the Bobby Gore Street Warrior Conference. And uh, we're going to be there to uh, work with young people. Uh, uh, it's going to be by one of your, uh, Rashad Ritchie's going to be uh, hosting it. And so it'll be May 28th. And Brother Solomon, King Solomon, is going to be speaking uh, to the young people. So that's going to be uh, okay. May 28th. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Dope, yeah. dope. And, and I know more information will come out in the weeks ahead yeah. prior to the official date and uh big shout out to Rashad Ritchie. He too also does good yeah. things in the community to the young people out there, man. So I'm happy to hear that. Uh King yeah. Solomon, looking forward to having you on the mental space. Uh we'll talk offline to discuss the particulars, man. It, it's definitely gonna be a great show. But of course, Star, uh she gonna get your information so you all can work together and, and what have you. But any any information or actually any last remarks, uh, King Solomon, you want to say to our people uh, before we let you go? My, my last remarks is I'm thankful and grateful to be out here to be able to speak on this platform. 
And I tell everybody, please, please look at your thoughts. Your thoughts are very important. As a man thinker, so is he or she. I appreciate it. I wish you all well. Good night and God bless. All right. God bless, brother. King Solomon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. On the Be Bright Morning Show, along, along with Chief Kamara. And we'll talk wow. offline as well, too, Chief. All right. I'm so proud of my brother, boy. I'm telling my brother, boy. I'm so proud of him, man. <laughs> yes, sir, <laughs> brother. All right. Indeed. Hell, all, right. All, hell, all hell to King Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. All right. All right. All right. Thank y'all. Y'all have a great morning and a great night. All right. All right. Hey, Peace and blessings. Um, this will be uh on, on on the radio station all over the uh all over, huh? Yep. It it'll be yep. It'll be on and you're still live, by the way. Yep. It'll be all <laughs> on our. <laughs> it'll be all on our our uh, platform. Shouts to one on one the vibe FM and uh in Louisville, Kentucky, as well as the Flow Television Network. Shouts to you guys. Thinking Out Loud wow. Network, and also on Beat Break 87 FM, Reach One Network, and all of our streaming platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeart Podcasts. So it's going to be everywhere, even YouTube. If you haven't already, y'all, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Beat Break Radio. So we're going to be everywhere. All right. Thank you. All <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Got to give the, the, hand, right. the hand applause to y'all guys again. All right. All right. All right. Thank y'all so much. All right, y'all. Uh, it's King Solomon and Chief Kamar on the Beat Break Morning Show. And, uh, yep, Chief, you got any last remarks to, uh, yourself as well? Oh, no, I'm just, again, again, I'm just proud of my brother, man. I think, you know, you all need to be looking out for him. And if you want to get, if you want to book um, my brother, uh, King Solomon, to speak, uh, you can reach out me. At 708-631-4123. And we can he, he wants to come speak at your school. He has a message to tell people we can talk to your youth to keep them out of trouble. Why not invest a little bit into you know getting a young man that can come in and, and get these young people on the right way? So uh, get King Solomon to come speak at your school, your church, your your uh, your youth groups. Uh, he's available for speaking engagements. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information, Chief Kamar. Appreciate it, man. All right. Love you, brother. Love, love you, brother Rashawn. I, I, I know you're going by Sean Garvey now, but love you, brother. Love hey, you, you still, you get, hey, it's only five people <laughs> that can still call me brother Rashawn. You one of them. So I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Much love, Thank brother. Yes, much sir. Much love. Okay. Much love. Peace. All right. Peace and blessings. Chief Kamar and King Solomon right here on the Beat Break Morning Show. Great interview, great conversation, Star. Loving, loving it, loving it. It was beyond beautiful. I, I know people, he's gonna change some lives just even with this interview. It, it's some brothers out there that really needed to hear that, especially coming from where he's come from. So he'll, he's gonna be able to relate to a lot of people and help a lot of the youth in the community. And I just can't wait to see what he does. I'm just so excited for him and the change that he's gonna bring about. Yeah, yeah, man, indeed, indeed. I love it, man. So let's do this, Star. We're gonna get into your, really quick, we're gonna get into your uh, trending report. Yeah, trending report. <laughs> we got we do so many segments here. I'm, I'm, I'm about to forget Star Kells name of her segment trend report so we're going to get into that in just a few moments we're going to take this quick break and we'll be right back with more of the beat break morning show all right welcome back to the beat break morning show and the beat break podcast sean garvey star kale still hanging out with yours truly and once again dj roll up is not with us this morning he will be back on with us next time we have to take care of an emergency or no, our prayers and thoughts go out to uh dj Rollum. uh so yeah great interview we've been having some great interviews thus far this morning and make sure once again ladies and gentlemen make sure you support the beat break morning show cash app us reach the number one communications you can also send in your contributions via paypal at Beat Break Radio and at Reach One Communications. Star, 
Ready yes. for the trending report? One of my favorite, one of my favorite segments of the show. I'm glad you like it. So let's get into what's trending, baby. Let's get in what's trending. Here is the trending report with Star Kel. All right, Star Kells, hit us with the trending report. Okay, you know, I like to keep you guys in the know on what's trending. And you guys know that I stalk Kanye West. So instead of ending off with him, I'm going to begin with him because he's <laughs> the light of my, of my trending report. <laughs> so I just want y'all to know one thing Kanye West is like, running shit right now on social media okay so shouts out to kanye west running things on social media beep bleep bleep on profanity anyways <laughs> too late <laughs> <laughs> so fans want kanye west to replace pete davidson <laughs> in space okay the, the fans are calling for kanye west to go into space um, as we all know, um, Pete Davidson was planning on going on Jeff uh, Bezos' Blue Oregon flight to space. Uh, well, now uh, Pete Davidson revealed that he will not be on that flight. He won't be on that list for the next launch. So people have replaced Pete in mind with Kanye West. So for me, I'm excited to see where this is going to go with Kanye going out in the space. Y'all know this sounds like something Kanye West is going to be excited about. I don't think so. I, I think it's more so subliminal. I think they basically saying that they want to replace Pete Davidson with Kanye West to say, okay, we're going to put Kanye West in a spaceship. We're going to send him off to space and hoping that he doesn't either come back to planet Earth or he stays in space until he gets his act together, until he gets his ish together. And then once he gets his ish together, then he can come back in the year 2080. In the year 2008? <laughs> okay, that's, that's pushing it a little bit, right? Okay, maybe 2040, how about that? <laughs> You know what? I was trying to support the thought of him just going to rediscover himself in space. But I mean, I kind of felt like people was just saying get lost. But I can't do that to Kanye. I want him to go out in the space and I want him to find himself, rejuvenate his superpowers, because you know Kanye West got superpowers, and then come back to planet Earth and bless us with his greatness. He's either going to find himself or find another Kim Kardashian. <laughs> yeah, but this time it got to be a futuristic hey. one. It got to be one of those futuristic alien, like half, kind of somewhat half human, half alien, <laughs> half futuristic Kim Kardashians out there in space. It's somebody out there for Kanye. You know how they say, you know how they say there's life? outside of planet earth well there is somebody like a kim kardashian outside of planet earth there is i do believe it now what she may look like is very interesting to me that's the part that i really kind of yeah anyway, hey we shall see like my daughter says mommy there are other human beings in different planets they not call human beings <laughs> It's some other type of living life outside of us. We are not the most important people in this galaxy, <laughs> according to my daughter. Oh, yeah, according to your daughter. Yeah, she, she's very <laughs> smart. She's very smart, by the way. She is. So what she says is true. <laughs> she knows. Anyways, Kanye, I had to put you on point first because you know I love me some Kanye. Okay, so let's get into our next topic. One of my favorite, most wonderful, best, beautiful singers in the whole entire planet of the universe, Mariah Carey. I love you. I want to shout out to you. So I don't know if you guys know, but Mariah Carey was caught in what was trending. <laughs> 
she went viral because she accidentally well at, at least that's what what they're saying but we'll we'll just go with it she accidentally uh text sean what's his name sean mattis i don't even know Sean mattis i thought you were about to say sean kingston uh right oh that would have been <laughs> a little hot text sean kingston but she accidentally uh, text uh, Sean Mattis. Um, Mariah Carey tweeted a text exchange between her and Sean M where she wished him happy Thanksgiving despite it being St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> what? Okay, that sounds like a drunk text to me. Right. <laughs> the only problem was she texted the wrong Sean M instead of texting her cousin, who she shares this joke with, she texts Sean Mattis instead. So she was supposed to be <laughs> texting her cousin and she ended up texting him and the internet loved it. They loved the entire situation and they literally took it to the streets, to the Instagram streets, to the Twitter streets and kind of like, you know, made fun of it only because I guess now they're seeing like, oh my God, like, Mariah Carey made a mistake and in, in messaged the wrong person. And I'm just like, they are human beings too. They do a number one and a number two, just like everybody else. Yes, they may text the wrong person. And I want to go viral. I have text hundreds <laughs> of messages to the wrong people. <laughs> and nobody is giving me it credit I, listen i had i had somebody true story a few days ago i had a random person a person that i did not know send me a text saying hey honey how you doing <laughs> guess what i did what did you i say? responded back by saying i'm doing good hon how are you <laughs> <laughs> then it took that person whoever it was took them a few minutes to think about it and be like, wait a minute, this is not such and such, is it? <laughs> I didn't respond after that because I, I didn't want it to go left. Right. So I just left it what it was and that was it. That's so, so crazy. Imagine, yeah, people do it all the time. You know, people, they do things by accident and what have you, but you know, that's why you gotta like, not be careful and, and don't really rush into sending somebody a text like just double check and make sure that you are sending the text to the right person that's so hard to do i accidentally sent some of my private areas to <laughs> the wrong person uh -huh. in life uh -huh. and they were so excited i remember seeing you know like how your phone is closed but you can see the like a briefing of the text until you open yeah. it up and you hope. So they're like, oh, hey, beautiful. Oh my God, you know, I've been dreaming and, and I saw the dot, dot, dots. And I'm like, who that? <laughs> I opened it up and I was so, Sean, let me uh, tell you something. My life was yeah. over. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, I didn't even know what to do. I was like, this man just saw things. My who oh. I put out, you know. Yeah. And I was supposed to be sending that to my man. And I was like, how wow. in the hell did right. this go to him? And I literally had to tell him, like, that was not meant for you. Um, somebody was playing in my phone. I don't know if it was my cousin. So I had to lie because I, first of all, I didn't want him to know and think it was mine, even though, I mean, if we put two and two together, he knows. But, but this, was per this was somebody that you knew. Yes, but not Somebody, like that. I ne uh, like not in that. Oh my God! I think um, the way he was messaging me back, like, "Oh, my dreams have came true," and oh, he I, definitely I, did. <laughs> oh my God, this is so disgusting. Oh, I don't even look at you like that. So I kind of, yeah. you know, and I actually haven't talked to him ever since because it's, it was such an awkward. It was an awkward situation. I got you. I'm I'm still living through it right now. But how yeah. much you want to bet? Well, how much you want to bet that person still has those pictures? I'm pretty sure they do. Good thing. Oh my, yeah. Good thing my face not in it. Oh yeah, yeah. Won't catch me. 
<laughs> oh yeah, man. What else you got for us in the trending report? That's what I got for the trending report. That's I, what. It, that's what you just gonna leave it at. That you just gonna leave it with the, the new pictures. You just gonna leave it with the new pit. We gonna leave it at the <laughs> yeah. Was, that's too much for me. I I I. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't want to think about anything else after that that comes out of your mouth other than those new pictures that you actually sent to your one of your male friends. Who is no longer my male friend on the count of the new pic. Mm-hmm. Because I can't yeah. have seeing my friend and imagining my body. You know how men are. They're visual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he could still, if you were still friends with him to this very day, he'd be texting you and calling you and be like, hey there. Hey there, right. chocolate beauty. How are you? Right. <laughs> Whole energy yeah. change. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Watch oh, yeah, man. The, yeah, the thirst is real, ladies and gentlemen. The thirst is real. All right, so time now to get into my hot four one wire. Let's go. I said, let's go. Oh, damn, technology. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was so, and I had this thing all queued up. Okay, one more time. Can we do it one more time? Yeah. All right, let's go with the hot four one wire real quick. All right, you heard it, the 41 Wire right here on the Beat Break Morning Show. So I got my own set of entertainment news that's just as much entertaining as the last story that Star put out there. <laughs> <laughs> and just like how uh, Star did with Kanye, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to end it with Kanye. I'm going to start it off with Kanye. <laughs> and I, I, there's going to be a point in time that, ladies and gentlemen, listen, there's going to be a point in time when I will stop talking about Kanye. <sighs> Because everybody, everybody still loves Kanye, but yeah, Kanye loves Kanye. All right, so <laughs> the 411 wire. Uh, Damon Dash says Kanye doesn't care about Grammy snub. What? Now, yeah, now, I mean, he didn't really get snub from the Grammys. He just cannot perform at the Grammys. Yeah, that's the big difference. He can't perform because of his recent tweets and his verbal attacks towards people like Trevor Noah and so forth. He cannot perform on stage at the Grammys, but he is still eligible to win at the Grammys. Uh, so Damon Dash is not happy about the Grammys snubbing Kanye West this year and thinks we should make our own award show. Uh, so in response to their, uh, in response to that, the invitation to him to appear at the 64th ceremony, Damon thinks we should make our own award show. Uh, so Damon Dash was asked by TMZ, by TMZ reporter about Kanye West not going to the most prominent music award ceremony. I don't know if it's the most prominent. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, by not performing at this year's Grammys uh, and what he might say if he wins his nomination. And so Damon responded in, in his own way by saying, Kanye don't give a blank about the Grammys. <laughs> yeah. And that, Damon, may, that may very well be true. Yeah. And, and Damon Dash also goes on to say that I'm not trying to fail in somebody else's system. So we just create our own. So we ain't got to worry about nobody else's rules. And uh, he also goes on to say, uh, what's the purpose of the money? This is what he asked the TMC reporter. What's the purpose of the money if you got to worry about people's rules as long as you ain't breaking no laws? Well, he got a point. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the, I mean, that, that's, that's Damon Dash. Like, he's going to speak his mind. He's going to speak his truth. He's, he's very passionate. He's very opinionated. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, we can't get inside of Kanye's mindset and be like, he cares about the awards. He doesn't care. Because back then, back when it was the old Kanye West, he really did give a damn about the awards. He wanted to win all of the Grammys. 
So for me, I think for for Kanye, I think it's more of him wanting to be seen and heard versus winning a Grammy. I, I think he would care about the Grammys just to be seen and heard, not to at this point to win a Grammy because he's been there, done that. You know, mm-hmm. it won't be anything exciting for him, but just to show face and, you know, be self-centered and into himself and <laughs> what he's doing, I think that he would care more about just being seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Kanye won a lot of awards. This, this, a, this, you get to a point as a celebrity where you have won 20, 30, 40 awards. Like, how many more awards do you even need in your home? How many more? Are you trying to break a record or something? <laughs> I don't even think after a certain amount, I don't think they even care to to win. You know, it's it's more of the thing like, okay, give it to someone else. You know, like I I didn't win as much as I can. The only good thing about continuing to win Grammys, it keeps you in a certain pay bracket when it comes to producing yeah, and artists. That's true. That's true. Uh, I did say this and I'll move on to the next story. I did say this on the mental space that Kanye, because me and my producer, Simone, from the mental space show on WLK, we had another disagreement this time on Kanye West not performing or being banned from performing at this year's Grammys. I was more so on the side of not performing at the Grammys. I don't think with his mental state, I don't think Kanye West needs to be performing at an award show like the Grammys this year. He needs to take some time to recalibrate, to really get his life together, uh, get his mind away from, uh, in, in, in essence, take it beyond that, he needs to just stay away from social media for 30 days or more. Yeah, kind of like fast it out. Yeah, I mean, fast yourself on social media, Go on an award fast. Like, that. there you go. Go on an award fast. Don't perform at any award show this year. Go on an award fast. I think that's going to be kind of hard for him. But at least, <laughs> I, I don't know. Because if he don't, if he goes on an award fast, he's going to find a way to be seen and heard. He might create another private listening or you know something where just like how he did just like he did in uh 2020 was it 2020 when he um put together his inaugural what you call it Mm -hmm. (laughs) with the bulletproof vest and he came out saying that i don't think harriet tubman freed the slaves that was like his own (laughs) that was his own press conference his own uh, presidential nominated (laughs) press conference <laughs> oh my but that'd be a good idea that'd be a good idea for kanye putting together his own award show call it the yay awards the yay awards yeah yes the yay awards how about that yeah that that can be that's, therapy. that's a good idea yeah perform hosted by kanye west or yay he goes by yay now hosted by yay with performances by Ye <laughs> and being nominated for X amount of awards. Uh, Ye in this category, Ye for this category, Ye for that category. <laughs> the Ye Awards. I wonder who is this audience, you know, gonna be? Probably um, poster boards of Ye. <laughs> Once again, because Kanye loves Kanye. There you go. There you go. I can't. So, okay. So yeah. So I, and there, there are already people who are boycotting the Grammys this year. Uh, so you know, Ye could be one of them, even though he is not going to be performing at the this year's Grammys Awards. He could just boycott it entirely and create the Yay Awards, the 2022 Yay Awards. How about that? But somebody somebody else that's not boycotting uh, this year awards is the Oscars, and it's, of course, Beyonce. Uh, Beyonce is set to perform 
Be Alive at this year's 2022 Oscars. Oh, yep. wow. Yeah, man. So and, she actually uh, perform at the Oscars? Yeah, she is slated to perform at this year's Oscars ceremony. Hmm. And she could she could win best original song at the 94th Academy Awards. Okay. Well, that's good. You know, we we've had issues with the Oscars in our community um over the past years. Um I have no comment about that. I don't know what to feel about the Oscars and some of our best talents, some of the best talent in the world being, you know, melanated, supporting a platform that doesn't truly support us. Mm, good segue into my next state, uh, into my next hot for one wire. Oh, before I get into that, for those that do not know, Be Alive is from the Will Smith, King Richard motion picture. So Beyonce sang that song in the King Richard movie, which by the way is a great film for those that haven't seen it. It's actually being nominated as, uh, it, it, King Richard is nominated at this year's Oscars as well too. So. Oh, wow. Me... Okay. Yeah, yeah. But they, know, but they know how to reel us back on in. <laughs> because we want to support each other you know so sometimes Absolutely. so you know the disclaimer is i am not beyonce and i am not will smith and i am not in the position to where i have to make that choice of whether i should you know attend or perform at the oscars so um i'm speaking from a, a place of not being in their shoes mm -hmm. uh so I will keep it neutral. That's what I'll say about that. And I will say that I am not Jada Picky Smith either. <laughs> <laughs> I nope. Can't... I am not Jada Picky Smith, and I will not be in any type of entanglements in 2022. All right. <laughs> <sighs> mm -hmm. Only on the Beat Break Morning Show. But uh, speaking of the Oscars, once again, and speaking of controversy, JC faces criticism for hosting Oscars party at hotel boycotted over alleged racial discrimination and sexual misconduct. So uh, JC <laughs> is set to uh, host an Oscars party at the hotel despite an ongoing boycott supported by Issa Rae, Spike Lee, and many more, to name a few. Huh. Okay, so according to The Hollywood Reporter, JC plans to host an event at the Chateau Milan, or Marant, I should say, in Los Angeles on Sunday, which is actually the same day as the Oscars. That's on March 27th. Now, JC previously held Oscar parties at the hotel but it currently faces a boycott supported by actress Issa Rae, which we all know from Insecure. So is the boycott on the hotel or on the Oscars? Just everything pertaining to the Oscars. Wow. Everything, the after parties, uh, the Oscar itself, yeah. Everything associated with the Oscars. And see, that's why and, I said <laughs> what I said. Hmm. Because yeah. it's still a sensitive uh, issue, you know. Um, but like, like I could say, I'm not walking in their shoes. So those just, those choices that they're making, they if it's not affecting you directly, sometimes you don't care, or sometimes um, your agenda is um, way bigger than what we think. Because even with Coachella. Um, we know that that is mostly predominantly for um, the white community uh, originally. And when Beyonce actually performed, it was, you know, a, a half and half, like, well, maybe she shouldn't, you know, or maybe she should. But when she got up there, she represented us <laughs> completely and fully with the HBCU um, tribute. So... For me, I feel like maybe there is another agenda and we don't know about it. 
You don't know. Uh, okay, so I got to get on my soapbox. Um, this will probably be my yeah. Let's make this my rant real quick. I got to get my sweep up. <laughs> yeah, let me make this my mock drop rant because I feel like we keep once again we keep going into circles. Y'all just giving me so much stuff to talk about on the morning show. It makes me not even want to leave from the morning show. It makes me not even want to end my morning show. Because y'all keep, <laughs> I mean, let, let's just get into this mic drop rant. Uh, I was trying to find something to rant about this morning, but now y'all giving me something to rant about this morning. So let's get into the mic drop rant right here on the Beat Break Morning Show. Let's get into it. All right, mic drop rant this morning, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, y'all about to get on my damn nerves about this one. Here. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so we were just talking about the Grammys, Kanye being banned from performing at the Grammys because of his recent antics. And then this whole boycott again against the Oscars or anything that's in association with the Oscars. Okay. When are you all going to learn <laughs> that the Oscars and the Grammys are not going to change what you all want them to do? Hmm. That's why we have all these other platforms, all these other award shows outside of the Oscars and outside of the Grammys, like why is it that we still have to get validation? Like let, let's get somebody on the morning show star and somebody please make it make sense to me. Please give me a great explanation on why we gotta still show validation or get validation from these big award shows, from the Oscars, from the Grammys. We got the BET Awards. We got the NAACP Awards. We got the Triumphant Awards. Hell, I mean, we got the BET Hip Hop Awards. Essence Awards. The Essence Awards. I mean, the Soul Train mm -hmm. Ladies of Soul <clears throat> Awards. I, we got... So many. What? So <laughs> many. And we don't put those award ceremonies on the same pedestal as the Oscars and the Grammys or even the Golden Globes. Yeah. Spike Lee won his first Oscar a couple of years back at the Oscars. Now he is on, on, on the, I hate to use the word bandwagon, but he's on the bandwagon with everybody else boycotting this year's award uh, ceremony this year. So you're trying to tell me if Spike Lee and he's a great filmmaker. Can't mm -hmm. take that away from him. Fantastic. But if you mean to tell me if he got nominated for a film that he did last year in 2021 and it happened to get nominated at the Oscars, do you think he would have been on the bandwagon with everybody else boycotting the awards? That's that really face? <laughs> That's that really look? <laughs> really? I don't know why y'all got mad at Tyler Perry, why y'all still, some of y'all folks are mad at Tyler Perry because he keep making the same Medea movies, but he was the one that was on the award show, I believe it was the BET Awards. He was on the BET Awards years ago and said, I'm not going to wait for me to go over and have a seat at their table. I'm going to create my own table. Hmm. Hmm. And he made that clear. <laughs> very clear what it's is it that y'all want <laughs> what is it that y'all want i mean surely they got a diversity and inclusion department at both the grammys and at the oscars <laughs> but if that's the case then maybe many of you all need to take your asses down to that department and do something about it. I mean, I'm not saying go beat up, not go beat up anybody. Don't like don't don't do like a Kanye in that cartoon video. But 
<laughs> like, demand some stuff. I don't know. I'm not in that world yet. But at least I create my own table. And that's what I was saying. You're right, Sean. You, you're completely right. They have more power than us. They have more followers. They have, the, and that's why I said the choices that they make, you want to boycott one way. And you're telling us, because a lot of celebrities tell us, oh, we need to make changes more in the system. So instead of going on a boycott, not doing nothing about it in the sense of let's just sit on our butts and not show up. No, show up and show out, go do something that you've never done before. And that's not walking or telling people to not go. No, go to the actual powers to be of the Oscars, uh, do some type of uh, written documentation of blah, 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 and getting 50 million people to sign it and present it. Like do something that will actually impact change. and not just talk about it like we're doing now. Spike Lee, yeah. plenty of movies. I mean, about us standing up for our rights and doing what we're supposed to do in another, in a more met methodological way. Did I say that right? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get it, we get it, we get it. No, I mean, you're right. Like there've been uh, so many black films or, or films with an entire black cast that came out last year in 2021 which we all think should have been nominated for an Oscar, but a lot of them ended up getting snubbed. Yeah. And so, you know, King Richard and the tragedy of Macbeth with Denzel Washington, those are like the only two films with a main African-American actor in them being nominated for an Academy Award. It's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Everybody else is of are Caucasian or with a white cast and, and what have you. You know, I, I try not to make, I try not to make everything racial, right? Like this morning show is for everybody. And we, we touch on so many things that are non-racial, but at the same time, and by the way too, we need to definitely bring that segment back. You may be a racist and you don't even know it. We definitely need to bring that back, <laughs> but that's a whole different thing. But, but yeah, but, like everything don't have to really be on oh they don't want us here they don't want us here they don't want us here well we can always go and create our own yeah we could or, or not even create our own but create another one yeah or you know either create another one or get folks like oprah byron allen Tyler Perry, many others, to go to these major networks, these big four networks, and tell them, you know what? We want an all American, we want an all African American award show. Have it televised on either this network or that network. Or support the ones we have and lift uplift those ones and put them on the pedestal that they deserve to be put on. Mm -hmm. why not why do we keep looking beyond us we're the greatness that we already have why do we keep looking beyond it as if we're not enough we're, we're enough we're more than I'm enough. just but you know it's just it's just so many options nowadays there's so many options especially with the internet that we have with the streaming right. platforms that we have we got so many options than ever before star you're right and we've been taking full advantage of them for our own personal reasons. And you've seen it on Netflix and Hulu and um, Amazon Prime. Like we've really kind of like even, even on stars, like major networks, HBO and stuff, we have really went above and beyond in those aspects when it comes to, oh, we got to get our stuff out there. But now this thing is affecting everybody and everyone is looking at it in our community. And we're not doing what we did for ourselves. That's why I say sometimes when we we're it's kind of a selfish thing. I think people, they start complaining when it, it affects them. When it's not affecting them, they don't have nothing to say about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
it's like a what have you done for me lately type of thing right it's not more so of hey what about us it's more so of, well what about me i i i what yeah about, yeah yeah so that's all i'm saying folks like come on man it's getting old it really is. It, it's it's getting old. I don't anticipate on watching neither the Grammys nor the Oscars. Neither. I already know who's going to win. I already know who's going to win. But big shout outs to Will Smith, though. Big shout outs to him because he did win his first Golden Globe Award for King Richard. Or was it, or I want to make sure I get it accurate. Was it Golden Globe or, um, Screen Actors, because there's other different award ceremonies, Screen Actors Guild Awards. Well, let's, I mean, we can always look it up. Make sure Let me look it up real quick. Make sure we're telling the truth. <laughs> I know, we, we got to make sure we keep things accurate around here on the Beat Break Morning Show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Will Smith. King Richard wins what? Um, so let's see here. Let's see. It says he he has won Best Leading Actor at the 2022 BAFTA Awards mm. for King Richard. Okay. I'm trying to see, did he win screen? Uh let's see. What would we do without Google? I know, right? <laughs> you can hear the type and see, this goes to show you that we're doing our research, ladies and gentlemen. Golden Globe, so he is nominated for the Golden Globe Award. He is nominated for a Golden Globe Award. Oscar, of course, we know the Oscar nomination. Awarded um, for the Best Actor, BAFT. Um, best Supporting Actress was the lady. So it was the Screen Actors Guild Awards. That's what it was, SAG. Screen SAG. Actors Guild, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I remember watching him on TV make a very, very profound award acceptance speech. I just wasn't sure what award show that was, but it was actually the 28th annual SAG Awards, which that's the acronym for a Screen Actors Guild Awards. He is, it, he's on all types of platforms right now. Crit Critics' Choice Movie, Satellite Award, NAACP Image Award, Outstanding, the AACTA International, BAFTA, like, yeah, Writers uh, Guild of America. I mean, he on fire. Yeah, yeah, man. He, he, he's one of the biggest names. One of the biggest names, biggest actors, talented actors in the industry. I would not be surprised at this year's Oscars. I would not be surprised if he wins his first Oscar award. I felt like he should have won an Oscar, not in Ali, but in the pursuit of happiness. Mm. No, I can agree with that. Yeah. He was no. nominated, he was nominated in Ali, and I think he was, yeah, he was nominated in, was he nominated in Concussion as well too, or did he get snubbed for that as well? I don't Thank remember, you but you know, remember the time when him and Jada started um, live streaming about boycotting? What were they doing? Yeah. What, was it the Oscars? It was the Oscars, the Oscars so white. Now, Will Smith didn't boycott. It was more so Jada Pickett Smith called for the boycott. That's the same thing. They married. <laughs> so what Jada says, uh, so what Jada says, Will says as well too. Well, it applies to him. I mean, the entanglement applied to him. Oh Lord, okay, that's Red table talk right. applied to him. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation right there. All right, and we're gonna leave it at that. We're gonna leave it on that note. It applies. Uh, <laughs>
All right, I'm not going to get into my fake news or not fake news this morning, um, but definitely thank you all for <laughs> tuning in to the Beat Break Morning Show. Well, the show is not done yet. Uh, in lieu of DJ Rollins' absence, we're going to have DJ Naturel come on the morning show and spin for us a little bit this morning. Um, and so we will be back next time on IG Live. Next time, we will be back on IG Live at yeah. 8 p.m. next Wednesday night. Uh, because what I want to do next Wednesday night, Star, I want to give people a recap of what went down on the Almost a Dating Game show. I definitely can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be juicy. Juicy and hilarious. Yes. <laughs> and I can't Something wait. Tell, I Something tells me this is going to be hilarious. What'd you say, Star? I think I'm more excited about it than you. Like, I'm like actually kind of like intrigued about this and how you're going to act on there and stuff. I just can't wait. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it offline, but uh, I don't know how this is going to go, man. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. I'm going to be all GQ'd up. Don't get it twisted now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be all GQ'd up. It's not... See, here's the thing. Even in 2022, we still go by first impressions. Yeah. Yeah. First impressions are everything. Hmm. And when I come on there, all GQ'd up and everything, everybody doesn't know who Sean Garvey is. And everybody have not seen Sean Garvey before. But when I get on there this Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with my GQ outfit on and everything, oh, my goodness. I'm going to be shutting the ish down. You're going to go viral, baby. Them ladies going to be blowing you up. I'm telling you. Even the people that's going to be tuning in, they're going to be like, oh, if you don't get him, I got to get him. I know that. That's, Sean, Sean is going to be setting up a third. Let me tell you, and, and it's, not, it's not the two mile horn or anything. It just is what it is. But I've seen the previous shows and, and big shout out to the creators of the show because I've seen episodes of almost a dating game show. But the contestants and, and, and some of the daters that I've seen on the show, they, I mean, they were cool, you know, but Y'all got to see what I'm going to bring on Sunday. You going to come through, huh, Sean? Oh, absolutely. I can't wait. Absolutely, man. So tune in. It's going to be on my Facebook page. The link is an internet show, by the way. So I'm going to put out the link at Sean Garvey on Facebook, Sean Garvey ATL, Instagram, and on Twitter. Tune in this Sunday night, 8 p.m., almost a dating game show and you can find it on youtube i believe they're going to live stream it on youtube as well oh, okay. yep almost a dating game show and it's hosted by kb and co-hosted by alicia bridges who we had on the morning show a few weeks back man so it's gonna be it's gonna be heavy y'all y'all pray for your brother pray for me pray for me you're gonna be all right. Be well, right. hey, the, the ladies better look all right. That's all I gotta say. They gotta look all right. <laughs> but no, damn that. <laughs> look, look good. Look more than all right. Look good. That's all I gotta say. Y'all always talking about y'all want a, a man with good hygiene. He gotta be tall, six one, dark and handsome and everything. And then some of you all look like bust downs. Whoa! I'm just saying. I mean, hey, that's facts, though. Yeah, I want to. Y'all, y'all be saying. Now, I'm not saying star. I'm just talking to some of my audience members. Some of y'all be saying y'all want a tall, dark, and handsome looking brother, but some of y'all looking. Y'all got that bust down face. I'm just saying. <laughs> Sean is about that tonight. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, follow me at Sean Garvey ATL Twitter, Instagram, Facebook Sean Garvey and of course my website SeanGarveyOnline.com Star, where can people follow you at? You guys can follow me uh, 
I want you guys to follow me at the Star Kill Show on Instagram. Follow me at the Star Kill Show on Instagram where you can get some entertainment from me, some acting and skits. Oh, on. what kind of entertainment? You know, because, you know, I like to do my little skits and my acting, my little um, comedy skits and stuff. So, I, you know what? I might as well go ahead and put it out there and let more people get in on the laughter. So, you guys follow me on Instagram at the Star Kill Show. And also, She Talk Atlanta on Instagram. And I just want to keep putting it out there. I have had people contact me and partner up with me with real estate. Uh, if you're a beginner at real estate or if you want to do some partnerships or you just want to be a private investor and get some money on the side, y'all follow me on Instagram, DM me at Real Estate Is Life Atlanta. And on Facebook, you can find me at Real Estate Life Is Life Atlanta too. All right. There you have it. Start got that entertainment for you. Okay. <laughs> Go to the website. I promise you. There won't be no pictures on there. There won't be no uh, new pictures or no <laughs> naked pictures like she sent to one of her ex-male friends on there. But <laughs> she definitely got some content on there, though. So y'all check her out. Uh, anyway, we out. Stay tuned for <laughs> the ATL traffic mix or the caffeine and energy drink mix by DJ Naturel. Take care, DJ Rollum. And until the next time. We love you, DJ Rollum. Good morning, the Beat Break Morning Show. <laughs>